Since the inception of whiskey and subsequently bourbon, the common goal was for providing the ability of a farmer to store grain for an indeterminate amount of time. As modern consumers, we understand that all grains have a shelf-stable life, and that is usually in reference to a best-used-by date. But historically, that lifespan was incredibly short. Industrial and technological advancement can take that grain a little farther, but there is also a time when the nutritional value and the usefulness of a particular grain is completely gone. Through scientific advancement and modern innovation, we've been able to cheat time, so to speak, and elongate those, but the value is on an exponential downward curve regardless of our intervention. Historical man, however, was pretty ingenious. They found a way to convert surplus grain into a commodity that is not only shelf-stable virtually indefinitely, but also something that is quite delicious. In my current line of work, I help to develop technological tools that enable farmers to be more efficient in their production, to help them create more commodities to further feed the world. I said it early on, but the story of farming is the story of America. The story of farming is also the story of American whiskey, which by proxy is the story of America. Advancement and refinement of both of those concepts parallel in an almost one-to-one -one relationship. Each bottle of whiskey is a culmination of a farmer and a distiller, two occupations that at one time were intertwined intrinsically and to some degree still are. Farmers are meteorologists, soil scientists, chemists, commodities traders, engineers, mechanics, and so, so much more. Distillers largely are the same thing. Phrases like terroir, tornado, single source grain, column stills, and distillation are all examples of the distiller playing the same role that the farmer plays for the crop. The farmer was the caretaker of the crop from its preconception to its harvest and beyond. But unless they are on farm processors, they sell the product to someone else and that's where the relationship is often severed. The distiller and its relationship to the grain is just starting at this point. They just took on the mantle of caretaker for the crop after it's harvested. While the product was originally an on-farm operation, over time it became industrialized. It became a function of specialization. Farmers' operations grew beyond their capability to craft distillate. Distillers became more efficient and more artistic with expressions, and the resulting relationship is harmonious and has its upsides. Major distillers try to capture some of the familiar nature of that product with concepts of grain to glass. It's the kind of catchphrase that you can liken to the restaurant industry's need to chase down farm to table. Restaurants latched onto the idea and ran with it, reviving the non-chain restaurant legacy in the United States. This movement created a connection to the products that transcends mere sustenance. People yearned to believe that their product was more than just some parcels tossed off the back of a larger delivery truck, something more than just a cog in a much larger machine. The ag industry recognized this connection and sought to exploit it at a degree further capturing terms like organic, cage-free, free-range, and a plethora of other titles that are largely meaningless. Not to be outdone, the distilling industry created grain to glass, hinting at some much more intentional relationship between the source of the ingredients and what finally comes out the other side. Largely, the whole concept of grain to glass is utterly meaningless. If you are a stiller, then yes, you are stewarding a product from its infancy when it was just a humble grain until it actually hits the bottom of the glass. But what does that really mean? I could spend the rest of this episode covering just that topic, but it's not the central theme here today. There's another movement, one with more meaning that is growing with, within the whiskey creators in the United States. Estate distillers are moving to the forefront of craft distilling. It's a growing sector within the market that is gaining credence. The idea of on-farm distilling is turning back the hands of time to its inception of the spirit and its true nature. There are a host of challenges and benefits that the estate distiller faces here in the United States, and we'll talk about three different estate brands that navigate these challenges and bring forward innovative products to the marketplace. Welcome to the Embellished Podcast, where we like to talk about stories. We like to explore how embellishment makes a story better, how it allows us to connect more deeply with both the person telling the story and the subject of the story. Together, we will explore people, products, and places that have a story to tell. We'll navigate through the truths, half-truths, and outright lies, and decide if truthiness even matters. The logistics of growing a new crop are overwhelming enough, but introduce the distillation process to the business plan and it makes it even more a labor of love. Farmers are susceptible to some of the same perils that whiskey making faces. 
Each year, a farmer will spend a great deal of time preparing the soil for planting, protecting the seed and the plant from threats, harvesting at just the right time, and then potentially storing that product until the market meets your financial needs. The distiller acquires the seed, carefully crafts the mash, distills the product, and then lays it to rest in a barrel for the hopeful creation of a marketable product at the end of the process. Any misstep in any of these steps could result in a lack of a marketable product and a significant waste of capital. Combining the two efforts exponentially increases the chance that you end up just wasting a bunch of money. Attention to detail is key for success. The first brand of today's episode epitomizes this attention to detail. One of the first things that stood out to me was a central theme in their website that hinged on a five-year study of rye varieties that are grown on their estate for the bottling of their own spirit. What was the point of the study? The hope was to determine if the rye variety had any direct impact on the flavor of the resulting product or not. Many distillers, craft included, pride themselves on sourcing grains directly from farmers, but that's more of a statement on the value of buying locally than a statement on product quality. Buying directly from farmers doesn't necessarily mean they are getting a single rye variety or even have any concern as to what the variety is. Far North Spirits, however, took the time and significant investment needed to explore what impact variety has on taste. After five years of research that involved planting, harvesting, fermenting, and distilling 15 varieties of rye, results show that the rye variety determines the flavor of the whiskey. Far North Spirits finds itself, as it's stated in the name, Far North. Far enough north that it's one of, if not the, northernmost distillery in the contiguous United States. As a result of its location, it can be prime real estate for growing rye. While rye is growing in popularity amongst the American consumer, it still seems to be the black sheep of the whiskey business in the United States. Traditionally, it's seen as an additive ingredient, not a main ingredient. However, as demand for bourbon booms and finding new and unique expressions of the spirit becomes increasingly difficult for the educated consumer, they'll find themselves seeking out rye as a bourbon supplement. It comes as no surprise that this grain that thrives in cooler climates often produces a spirit that is also very cold weather friendly. As a result, Far North places rye at the forefront of their operation and captures bourbon only as an afterthought. Their dedication to the grain is apparent in their examination and care of the crop itself. The thought of a major distiller taking the time to plant test plots, age small batches of whiskey, and produce a spirit to see which grain reigns supreme is borderline absurd. Far North Spirits places much more emphasis on their farming legacy than the historical account of their connection to the distilling industry, and sometimes farming legacy stories sound an awful lot like whiskey legacy stories. They are steeped in tradition and a connection to the product being made. Being an estate distillery with smaller production concerns, you can achieve just that. You can explore and innovate. You can learn about grains and how they impact flavor. It's just a part of the farmer's nature to need to experiment with new strategies. The next estate distiller has been carving out their own piece of the whiskey industry for the last 15 years, but they've really been making significant waves in the last five. One of the most impressive things about this distillery to me is the sheer amount of experimentation that the estate has embarked upon. I was listening to a podcast where the distiller and owner was talking about making their own still and attempting to malt their own grain. There might even be a few peat experiments laying around in their barrel warehouses. They have about 10% of the barrel house's space occupied with some obscure ideas. There's a true farmer's nature at the center of the identity of this brand. They've gone so far as to create their own absinthe just because someone told them they couldn't do it. If you haven't spent a great deal of time around farmers, they can be often considered stubborn. That's just the trait that's needed to squeeze a living out of the soil in tough times. Almost anyone can be a farmer in an ideal crop year, but you introduce the ideas of flooding, drought, pest infestation, or any other of a myriad of situations, and it results in the most stubborn and resilient of people that come out the other side. When Frey Ranch started their distilling operations, it was using a homemade 50-gallon still and storing up whiskey that they weren't even allowed to sell yet. The state of Nevada had allowed for small distillers to make product, but they hadn't carved out the how or who they could sell it to. While they weren't new to the spirits industry, what an amazing risk to take. Distilling and barreling products not knowing if you could ever sell it? Free Ranch had cut their teeth in the spirits industry by creating a successful winery. The whiskey business was beginning to boom, and after a few years in the barrel, they were released. Frey Ranch is an operational farm, and as such, they planned for the continuation of legitimate on-farm activities. 
When they opened their main distilling operation in 2013, they created an operation that would only be used at 10% capacity. This enabled them to continue using the summers as a time for caretaking of the crop and generation of grain. Once the growing season was over and the crop was harvested, they divvied up the product between the cattle operation and their distillery, and their 10% share of the grain can go into full production mode during the winter months. Beyond that, they use farming techniques to impart different characteristics to the grain that will be distilled. Colby, the owner and proprietor of Frey Ranch, drought stresses his rye to create a smaller grain. He likens the idea to a smaller grape being more full of flavor. And the thought is that the smaller rye grain results in a spicier flavor profile. And this, to me, is the identity of a farmer. It's, it's the identity of a distiller. Experimentation and exploration are the keys to their success. Experimentation gets more expensive as your production capability scales up. When I was a child, I accompanied an uncle to look at cars that he was interested in purchasing. Through a conversation with the salesperson, he asked them if, if he could get a cheaper price if he were to buy three of them. Little did I know, I was getting a brief introduction to the idea of economies of scale. Much later in life, I learned exactly what the cost of trying to halt a monolithic operation might actually be. What does this have to do with today's subject? Well, this is one of the advantages that an estate distiller has. Not only do they get the agility to be able to craft smaller batches and experiment with new mash bills, but they gain the ability to plan and intentionally plant new grains and bring into fruition an, a distilled spirit. Much like the previous brand, Hill Rock Estate Distillery can trace its current inception back to the mid-2000s. The marketplace for whiskey was expanding and the American consumer was looking for a more personal connection with the things that they bought. We were moving from a transactional relationship with the things we consumed to a more intentional one. While Hill Rock is not championed by a long line of farmers, it appears their focus is one of intentionality. The operation is more similarly aligned with a winery. There's a focus on terroir, and the entire farm is focused around serving the distillery. One of the flagship offerings is a Solera aged whiskey. I won't go into detail on what Solera is here, but what is interesting is the whiskey is aged in Oloroso sherry casks. If you poke around the whiskey marketplace very much, you'll find Hill Rock offerings in Sauternes, Cabernet, and a host of other options. This particular brand focuses on the idea of being a distillery with a farm built around it. Wine aging can be a fickle operation that results in undrinkable offerings, but if done right, it can be transcendent. Larger brands have a tough time justifying the production downtime to create these experiments of malting their own grain or aging in a new barrel type, but these estate distillers can focus on smaller details and create these unique offerings. This type of personality trait is the one that bridges the distiller and the farmer gap. It's no wonder that when Hill Rock was sorting out their business plan that they employed the help of Dave Pickerel. Pickerel is widely known as the Johnny Appleseed of craft distilling and helped launch a host of distilling operations that focused on the intentionality of their operation over the ability to make as much cash as they quickly can. We've explored today some of the benefits of on-farm distillation, but there are a few drawbacks as well. One of them being, if you grow it, ferment it, distill it, barrel it, age it, and bottle it, there's no one left to blame when it goes wrong. And conversely, when it goes right, well, guess who gets 100% of the credit? The farmer has the opportunity to spend so much time planning and caring for a crop. That opportunity to create a consumable product can be wiped away with a flood, a drought, or simply just a strong gust of wind. The entire investment down the drain. Similarly, the distiller has the ability to craft a distillate and put it into a barrel to come out the other side with something that is worthless or potentially even empty. This connection to the process pervades both personalities and is only amplified when the farmer is the distiller. Their connection to the end product is magnified. Farm distilling allows for experimentation that even small craft distilleries can't get to. The product Pre-barrel is called distillate. It's a chemical designation that's indicative of the process, but it's also descriptive of the process. The sweat, the toil, grain, care, effort, hope, it's all distilled down into one consumable product to be put on a shelf and hopefully picked up by one of us as we walk by. It's tough not to wax poetic about the whole process. I got a text from a friend last week that said, bourbon is so fascinating. It really is. It's a connection to humanity, to the ability to capture the essence of nature in one of the most artistic ways and then share it with the rest of mankind. Thanks for listening to the Embellished Podcast. If you like what you heard, make sure you subscribe. 
Check out our website at embellishpod.com and follow us on social media at Instagram and Twitter to keep up with what we have going on. If you have an idea about a story we should talk about, send it to us at embellishpod at gmail.com. And remember, whether famous or infamous, a good story mixed with a touch of embellishment makes the food you ate, the drink you drank, and the places you visited just a little more memorable. 